Hello, 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 everyone. It is Reverend Tanika Steens. I am the Mindful Coach, and this is Mindful Intentions Nurture and Drive Your Business. And today I am sitting outside because it is beautiful, and you know how I love the nice warm weather. But I've got a great guest. His name is John J. Giordano. He is a doctor of human letters, C-C-J-S-M-A-C-C-A-P, and he'll tell you all about that when he comes on. Mr. John Giordano is an expert in the treatment of addiction, mental health, and the founder of the National Institute for Holistic Addiction Studies. He is the author of Proven Holistic Treatment for Addiction and Chronic Relapse, How to Beat Your Addictions and Live a Quality Life. And most of his recent books is the acclaimed The Kid from the South Bronx Who Never Gave Up and is the co-author of Molecular Neurobiology of Addiction Recovery, the 12 Steps Program and Fellowship. Over 20 years ago, Giordano Inpatient Outpatient, I'm sorry, founded the prestigious g, &G Holistic Addiction Treatment Center in North Miami Beach, Florida. It's a 62 bed inpatient outpatient and it's accredited addiction treatment facility. So today he is going to talk to us about a lot of different things and so maybe it's something that resonates with you so tune in get your pen and paper write this stuff down so you can take it with you hello john welcome thank you so much for being here today thank you well what i'm going to do i like to start off with my latest book which is the kid from the south bronx who never gave up and the reason i wrote it was because i wanted to show people that no matter what happens to you in life no matter how far down you go, okay, no matter who gets in your way, you could still be successful. When I started my journey, I was homeless. Wow. I, um, when I got into recovery, um, we got divorced, and I wound up, my friend loaned me a room in a hotel that he owned. I had no place. I had a bicycle that somebody loaned me. Uh, I had a jar where I used to put my change when I had change. And um, it was rough going. So what I did was, um, I'll, I'll go into my whole story. Let me, let me just read this part of the book. This is the book. Thank you for sharing. Okay. Now, it talks about how I turned $300 into $45 million. All right. Listen up, people. Okay. And... Well, here's the way it goes. Okay, here's my roadmap for positive change. There is one thing in this world, one special lesson, one constant that has guided me through the turbulent waters of life. This infinite rule, which most people know but ignore or who simply do not follow their life lessons. That is, no matter what, no matter the circumstances, the obstacles, the people that get in our way or things that slow us down follow this one simple rule. Never give up. Never give up on your dreams. Never let go of your passions. And especially, never give up on yourself or a God of your understanding. Now, I was blessed to become extremely successful, and I'd like to share my story with you. This is how my life was transformed and how I was saved from falling into the abyss of hell. And by following this one rule and learning how to have a life worth living. So I'll go into my story a little bit and then I'm gonna uh, share with you some things that you can do that can help you with depression, addiction, and things like that, things that are not uh, mainstream. In order for people to listen to me, I was fortunate enough to be involved with scientists and researchers. So I'm, I'm currently in 79 medical and scientific peer-reviewed journals. For those who don't know what that is, most doctors don't even have one journal. That means you have to go in front of a peer-reviewed board and they see what you wrote and see if it has uh, efficacy and see if it's, it has you know, merit, and then they put it in different journals. And uh, I work with about 15 to 20 universities, scientists, researchers, and doctors. Now, when I tell you my story, it's kind of comical when you start to listen. First of all, I'm a kid from the South Bronx. Uh, I was brought up in an inner city neighborhood in the projects. 
And um, my father was a heroin dealer. My family was a mafia type family. Uh, my uncles were hitmen, and uh, they did a lot of nefarious things. I'll put it that way. And I give you an example in the book. It talks about my uncle. One of my uncles threw my wedding for me. I was twenty, and the uh, caterer insulted him in front of the family. So the next morning, he killed him. Uh, my story is one where I only went to the ninth grade. When I was eight years old, my father went to jail. When I was eight and a half, I got molested by some boys in the neighborhood. I also got molested by a girl when I was nine. She was 14. She was my babysitter and how it affected me. I share all this stuff with everybody because I know that it may touch someone's soul. And, uh, you know, I, I was raised a Catholic. I call myself a recovering Catholic now. Um, and I said, I would never be like my family. Now, I was in gangs when I was a kid. I was in a, in a black gang. I was in a Hispanic gang, an Irish gang, an Italian gang. I was in all kinds of different gangs when I was a kid. And um, what got me out of the gangs was I, I became, I went into karate classes. And uh, I, I talk about that in the book too. The only reason I went into the karate class is because my friend and I were passing a karate school and I said, you know what? Let's see how tough the karate teacher is. I suggest you don't do that, by the way. <laughs> we we um we went upstairs to the to the karate school and uh, the teacher was teaching, but it was getting late and I had to get home. I was 14 and a half years old. My father was out of jail by then. And uh I had to get home, or my father was going to hit me with the belt. Because if I was one minute late, I got a good strapping. So I went home. I told my father I wanted to join the school. Now, I didn't really want to join the school. I just wanted to see if I could beat up the teacher. So anyway, he said, yeah, yeah, you can join. Yeah, sign. My mother said no. My father said, yeah, let him join and join. So I get into the school. It was jujitsu. I didn't even know the difference, judo, jujitsu. Who knows? I didn't care. So the teacher was teaching. They taught us how to fall. They taught us how to roll out. And then they had us in a circle and they said, I need a volunteer. I want to show you guys how to block a punch. So I raised my hand right away. So as he's talking to the class, I decided to sneak punch him in the head. Another mistake, by the way. All I know is I winded up from point A to point B. Point B was on the floor with a foot in my throat and his little round face smiling at me. Well, let me tell you something. I fell in love with the martial arts. I couldn't get enough of it. I became a, a national karate champion. I'm in a couple of Black Belt Hall of Fame. Uh, I'm a grandmaster today, which is a 10th degree black belt. I have over 200 black belts that are under me that are karate champions. And I did real well with all that. But when I was around 20, I started doing drugs. I got with this girl. And, you know, everything I learned not to do, I did. And then I became a drug dealer. Then I used to do collection work for the smugglers. Um, you know, I did all the wrong steps. And I was really getting out of hand with the way I was. I was 37 years old. By the time my family did an intervention on me. And uh, I told you who my family was. So I was wondering who's doing an intervention on them. <laughs> So an intervention is when people get together and they tell you what you're doing and you need to go to treatment to make it simplistic. So I said, look, man, all right, I'll go to treatment. I figured my mother said she'll never talk to me again. And Italian mothers don't do that, you know. And I said, okay, I'll go. So I had some Coke in my sock and I went into the bathroom. I did a couple of hits of the Coke and then I went up to the their uh, treatment center. Anyway, uh, I said, I didn't want to even get high with these people. What am I doing here? But I kept going and I kept doing it. I kept doing it. I don't want to give away the whole book. And things happened. And I had a spiritual awakening in, in, the, in treatment. And I started to realize the things I was doing to myself and to other people, to my family. And uh, I, uh, I came out. And, you know, I still didn't believe in God anymore. I used to curse God. So I, I can tell you how... How comical that is today. I'm also a chaplain for the North Miami Police Department. 
and I do trauma work, and I work with uh, officers that have been in shootings, uh, and uh, also guys coming back and women coming back from Iraq, Afghanistan, uh, that have PTSD. So I work with that also, uh, and drug addicts and alcoholics and people who have mental health issues. Uh, like I said, I went to school. I only went to the ninth grade. I got left back in the sixth grade because I was the class clown. And uh, so I have all this trauma going through my life, which I didn't realize was trauma. I didn't, it's just things that happened, you know. And uh, I went back to school when I got clean. Um, I got my GED. I went back. I went to college. I went, they're all the things that you're supposed to do. Uh, when I went to college, I was looking at the book, and I looked at when it was printed. It was seven years old. And I said, wait a second. By the time I get out, it's already outdated. By the time I get out, it's being antiquated. So I no longer went to college. What I did was I went to different schools to get certification. So I have a master's NLP. That CAP is a certified addiction professional. I have a master's in addiction counseling. I'm a criminal justice specialist. I, I do a lot of stuff. I'm a hypnotherapist. So I, I went to all the things that I felt were that really worked, not the standard way of looking at things. And it, it's interesting because, you know, I teach at different, I was teaching at different colleges, teaching people how to do group therapy, teaching them how to, you know, talk to addicts. Um, you know, a lot of people read out of a book, but that's not how you talk to addicts. You know, you got to talk from your heart, not from your head. First of all, they got low self-esteem to begin with. And uh, you just, when you start talking down to them, as they perceive that you're talking down, even though you're not, all right, they're not paying attention. If they can't relate to you, they just zone out. So those are the things I did. And um, then my son almost died from this, and my wife almost died from this disease, and I almost died from it. My son almost OD'd. He, uh, they were putting chocolate down his throat. This is when I was in recovery. Um, and I'm watching my son dying on a bed. And I, I don't know about anyone else, but I, I can't even relate to people that had children that died. And um, it was like mind boggling to me. And thank God he came out okay. And today he's got 18 years in recovery. He has integrity, he has values. Uh, you know, I put him into treatment. I, he got arrested, I left him in jail. I did everything. You know, that I knew that was the right thing to do. You know, and um, so these are the lessons that I learned in life. And I, I turned my life around uh, to create something that I felt had value that helps God's kids. And that's my mission in life. And it's, it's not about the money. It never was about the money. Even when we opened our treatment center up, we were broke as a joke. My partner used to work for the one of the families in New York. Uh, he used to do the collection work with all the gambling unit, all the gambling places, and uh, he got into recovery. We had a similar background with our families, and uh, we turned our life around, you know. But even when I was using, okay, believe it or not, I did a lot of things, okay? That doesn't mean because you're... Uh, an addict that you can't be productive also, which I was to a point. Um, I did eight plays in the theater performing arts. I uh, I threw the, uh, the James Brown concert in Liberty City in Overtown. Liberty City in Overtown is in the black community. And they had riots over there. Most of my black belts are from that community because that's where I taught karate, which is another story I'll tell you, which is kind of comical. Uh, this white guy walking in was 1965, walking into the black community into, and it's called Carver YMCA. So I'm walking, here I am, one of my students uh, was one of my black belts. He was a gang leader originally, went to Vietnam, came back, worked with Ty Kim and, you know, really a tough guy, everybody respected him. Um, and he became one of my students. After I had to punch him around a little bit, then he respected me because that's how the street is, you know. Um, anyway, I, I walk into this place. Here I am. I had long hair. I had a mustache. I had no shoes on in my karate uniform walking through this YMCA. 
So I walk through the pool hall and everybody stops playing pool. It's like they've never seen a white guy before. <laughs> and I, I, walk, I walk through, because I'm from New York, I don't know about color. You know? <laughs> so, so I walk, I, I walk through the, uh, the gym and everybody stops working out. And I walk in the back where the school was. So one of the weightlifters came back. This guy's arm was bigger than my leg. And he says to me, hey, white boy, you think you could kick my ass? I said, yeah. I says, come on the mat. So he gets on the mat. He tries to sneak punch me. I sidestep him around, kick him in the solar plexus, knock him to the ground. He can't breathe. Then my student comes in. He goes, oh, I see you met my teacher. <laughs> <laughs> Full that's, circle, right? <laughs> that's where we got most of the kids in the neighborhood, believe it or not. Wow. And uh, so when I, when I uh, eventually, when I threw this concert with James Brown, it was to help revitalize Liberty City because that community got devastated with the riots and nobody wanted to go in the community anymore. So what happened was I worked for this flea market USA. It had five business, 500 businesses under one roof. And I says, look, you know, they wanted something, a, a, a big concert, you know, a grand opening. So I got James Brown through a friend of mine. And I became friends with James. And uh, I said, look, we, we definitely need, okay, a theme. So the theme was how to rebuild the community. So what I did was I went to the SBA people, a small business association, and I told them what we were doing. And they, I wanted them to help people that got booths in the flea market to show them how to buy wholesale, how to run a business and things like that. Then I went to all of the deacons and all of the churches and all of the pastors. So I was singing in the, in the, in the churches and dancing with everybody, you know, and, um, then I wanted to invite President Reagan to the opening of the flea market. Well, everybody, of course, they laughed at me, you know, and they said, John, we love you, but I don't think the president is going to come to a flea market. I said, well, you never know. So two weeks later, I got a letter back from the White House. Matter of fact, that, that letter's in the book, so you can see that I'm not telling you a story. Um, and it said, the president's sorry that he couldn't come due to, you know, uh, scheduling. Well, we're going to send a representative. So they sent Carrie Meeks. Carrie Meeks at the time was a state representative later to become a Senator Meeks. She went around, and, you know, they really check you out because, you know, they're not just going to have anybody come. And they went around and she saw what I was doing in the community for all the years, teaching the kids and even though I was using drugs and doing, you know, I wasn't that heavy back then. It was just a weekend thing. And that was in the 60s when it was like quite a, kind of common, I guess. Anyway, she went to the Martin Luther King Foundation and they presented me with the Martin Luther King Award on stage in front of 60,000 people. I, I put it on, uh, it, the, you'll see pictures in the book and you'll also see it on my uh, my webpage, John, the initial J, Giordano.com, uh, you'll see the concert. And you'll see all the people. So if you think I'm telling you a story, I'm not. Because I know nobody believes anybody. So I like showing pictures. It's easier that way. Anyway, so I had all this, this, this stuff going on inside of me that I, I, I could have. God gave me so much talent but I was destroying it with drugs and alcohol and these bad behaviors. So when I got clean, I decided to, and my son almost died, and then I watched my wife get intubated where she OD'd. Um, I mean, I thought this nightmare would never end, but it, it did, and it kept going, and I found different ways to help people. Now, let's talk about how we're going to help people. All right, now you got a little background on me. All right, so now let's talk about help because we always talk about the devil side, but we're not talking about the angel side. All right, so let's let's get to the the healing part. Okay, the destruction part. Those of you who are out there in that mode, you know what that's all about. We all have our stories. Some are worse than mine. Some are not as worse. It doesn't matter. Whatever floats your boat that got you to sink your boat <laughs> is what it is. 
So what I decided to do was I had this treatment center I opened up. Uh, it's a 62-bed inpatient facility. That was the third treatment center. I'm not going to tell you what happened to the first two because I got with the wrong people, my doctor and my therapist. Uh, in plain English, they, uh, they screwed me. I know I, I didn't think they could do that, but they did. Um, but that's in the book. So you want the book? I mean, I'm not selling books. I give them away, actually. Hey, this is your platform right now. Do what you need to do. <laughs> All right. So you get it on Amazon. You know, it's $10. I mean, look. So uh, the bottom line is, is that I said, you know, something's missing. People have depression. They have anxiety. They try to medicate it with drugs and alcohol. Some people get injuries. And they, they, they take pain pills, and then all of a sudden they become addicted. And they don't know how to get off of it. So these are some of the things that happen. So let's take a look at what I found, all right? Since I got, no, who's going to listen to a kid from the South Bronx, all right, who's got these certifications? So when I got with all these scientists and all these researchers and all these guys, I hooked up with uh, Dr. Ken Blum. He's the geneticist who found the addiction gene. Guess what? There is an addiction gene. It's the main gene, which is called the DRD2 ALE1 variant gene. Okay? Now, you can have a mild, moderate, or severe propensity for addiction. Doesn't mean you're going to be an addict. That means you can be, because there's such a thing as epigenetics. Now, epigenetics means your social environment can change that gene expression. Okay? So that's one thing. Now, when people suffer from anxiety and depression, most people don't understand that your gut, your microbiome, your microbiota, it's called the flora in your gut, the bacteria in your gut, whatever term you want to use to understand it. 90% of dopamine and serotonin, those are the feel-good drugs that we manufacture naturally, is manufactured in your gut. Most people don't know that. They think it's in your brain. It's not. Only some of it. It goes up your vagus nerve and deposits the dopamine and serotonin in your brain. <laughs> okay? So now, let's take a look at this. If you don't take care of your gut, all right, what happens? Everything gets out of balance. Yeah. Most people eat very unhealthy. You got the, you got the um, I, I also work with Native Americans. Uh, their diet, they get diabetes, high blood pressure. Same with African American communities, diabetes, high blood pressure. Um, some of that's based on genetics, but some, most of it's based on diet. All right. Our food supply is uh, based on uh, sugars and uh, processed food. And our body's not meant to have that. And so what happens is, is that we get overweight, okay? And then all these ailments start happening. Come on, preach now. Huh? I said, come on and preach now, because it's the truth. I know. Listen, I, listen, guys, all I can tell you, I'm going to be 76 in August, okay? I Say that always, again. Say that I'm gonna, again. I'm going to be 76. No way. So I work out. I'm in great shape. I eat really well, Okay. So this homie don't just say stuff and doesn't do what he says. I don't smoke cigarettes. I don't drink alcohol. I don't do drugs. Okay? I did that. And that was my other life. This life, I decided, mm -mm. living longer is one thing, but living a quality of life now is a whole mm. other thing. So... Problem is, most people don't understand. They go to Burger King, they go to Chicken Fry, and you know, and all this kind of stuff. Listen, guys, all I can tell you is this if you want to spend your money on doctors and be in hospitals and being sick in bed and having old people take care of you, do what you're doing. I always tell people, how healthy do you want to be? Is it easy? Absolutely not. But what you guys are doing the wrong way is much harder, believe it or not. Mm -hmm. Because this stuff shows up, all of a sudden you get hit, man. And you go, well, I don't understand. How could that happen? It's real easy. Look at what you're doing. So food and most people, believe it or not, are volume depleted. Now, what does that mean? 
they don't drink enough water. We're made of about, I don't know, maybe 80, 90% liquid, right? Mm -hmm. If you don't drink water, it's like, give me an example. It's like trying to clean your floors with a dry mop. How are you going to clean yourself inside with a dry mop, man? You have to drink water so you can clean out the toxins out of your body. And people don't look at it that way. No, drinking soda, drinking tea, drinking coffee, drinking energy drinks, that's not water. So if you want to go that route, say, well, I drink, uh, that's baloney, okay? So look, I just say the way, like like I always say to people, homie, don't play, okay? (laughs) I just tell you the way it is, all right? You don't want to believe it? That's okay, don't believe it. I always tell people, don't believe a word I tell you. Please don't go look it up. Mm-hmm. And then you let me know. So now let's look at some of the other causes of depression and anxiety. People have, and most women know about this one, people have low thyroid. If you have a low thyroid, you're going to have depression or anxiety. Oh, let's give you Prozac. Oh, wait a second. Prozac doesn't work for thyroid. They keep throwing medications at us. We're walking cash registers for the pharmaceutical companies. We're not looking at the cause. We're looking at the symptoms. They want to keep us kind of alive, I would say, as long as they can, because we keep buying medications, man. If you've got good health care, they definitely want you, right? They want you, man. (laughs) Let me tell you something. Okay? So the bottom line is is that you got to take care of yourself, because if you don't, who's going to? So you got to look at your thyroid. Then you can have what is known as leaky gut syndrome. Go look it up. An H. pylori infection in your gut. Okay, this causes depression and anxiety and autoimmune diseases. Go look it up. Also, hypoglycemia, low blood sugar. Okay, if you have low blood sugar, you're going to have depression and anxiety. A lot of alcoholics have that. Then... You have closed head injuries. All right? Closed head injuries cause depression, anxiety, and behavioral problems. Look at your football players. Look at your boxers. Look at people that uh, fall down, hit the head, get concussions. Okay? All of this stuff that goes on. So we're not looking at people comprehensively. We're only looking at them psychologically. I believe there's more to us than just the head walking around. Mm-hmm. If that's the case, send your head to treat and leave your body home. Okay? So if you really want to learn what's really going on with you, you want to see, your doctor's probably not going to do this, you want to get a micronutrient test. Well, what is that? That can tell you what nutrients that you're deficient with. Okay? Then there's another test that's like a poop test, we can call it, okay, where they... Uh, They test your poop, actually, okay, your your feces, and they see what's going on in your gut. And especially if you take antibiotics, that only destroys the bad stuff, it destroys the good stuff, too. So you need to take probiotics, prebiotics, and need to take enzymes with your food so you can get the nutrients out of your food. When your system is not working properly, okay, you might as well be cardboard. Mm-hmm. So the problem is with a lot of us Americans, we got lazy. All right? We want a quick fix. We want a quick meal. We got, oh, we're busy. We're always busy. Well, if you're too busy for your health, then you ain't going to be around too long to worry about being busy. All right? You know, that's just the way it is. I want to go on as long as I can, but I want to be a quality life. I don't want to have just long life. Yeah. Hanging out in the bed, you know? So it's time to do an evaluation on yourselves. And look, nobody does it perfect. I didn't do it perfect either, you know? So, you know, you just got to keep going, man. Don't let anything stop you because... You know, people say, well, I can't make a decision. Well, guess what? No decision is a decision. It is. Simple stuff. You see? So, 
you know, you want to get on the right nutrients to see what you're deficient in. You want to drink your water. You want to take care of your gut and take care of your food supply, man. Listen, you know, unfortunately, the food in this country is the best country in the world. Well, I'm not going to say it's not. But when you start to look at our food supply, it's all about money, power, and control. Okay? And the poor people, okay, in the communities are the ones that suffer the most. Mm -hmm. All right? And the bottom line is, is that we don't have to suffer. We can make better choices. And the bottom, what, what, what I keep telling people, look, instead of having that Burger King, do a veggie burger. Oh, veggie burger, I don't want that. You know, they're not so bad. I eat them. I thought it's a salad. And I look, I'm not a rabbit. Okay. <laughs> but it's not so bad. You know, do your best to eat better quality food. But look at the chickens that we have. The chickens are shot up with so much stuff. You know, they're, they're drug addicts. <laughs> they're scary. Yeah. Oh, my goodness. Chicken wings are like this, like this big. Like, what is going on? Yeah, what's going like, on? I don't is, want that. <laughs> they're doing growth hormones in the chicken. Yeah, absolutely. Everything's about making money and killing us. Yeah, and since the pandemic, it's gotten worse. Of course it got worse because nobody cares. You know, uh, then you got the meat people. Uh, they're coloring the meat to make it look better for us. They're shooting it up with all kinds of antibiotics and all kinds of stuff. And remember what we said about antibiotics. So most people say, well, what am, what am I going to eat? Well, you know, if you look online, excuse me, if you look online to people that live the longest, it's usually people that are, are vegan or vegetarians. And, you know, drinking cow's milk is really not good for you. No, we're not I, cows. Don't, I, I don't allow my kids to. I don't. Yeah. I do we're not, not. We're not cows. <laughs> Okay, so, I mean, look, uh, there's a lot of weird stuff going on out there. I just came across something that it blew me away, okay? And I, I don't usually get blown away too easy because I'm always looking for different alternative treatments that help, okay? Well, one of the problems we have with addiction is when people, even the people that never wanted to become an addict, okay, got an injury, got caught up on... Um, you know, opioids, oxycodone, oxycodone, Percocets, Vicodin, or whatever, okay? They want to get off of these. They we, we they go to treatment. We get them off the drugs. Now they come off, but they're still in pain. Mm -hmm. So what happens? Eventually, they go back on the drugs. We tell them, do yoga, do stretching. Yes, that helps, but it surely doesn't get rid of you have serious pain. Mm -hmm. Okay? I found something that gets rid of the pain. Okay, and I don't want you to believe me. It's, I, I sent a bunch of friends of mine to this place. One of my friends used to walk with a walker for six years. He's 85. He doesn't walk with a walker anymore. And I want to explain to you what it is. A friend of mine's a lobbyist. A lobbyist is somebody that's, you know, it's, you know this is for our, our audience, somebody that's in Congress and they, they lobby people to, put certain bills through in the Senate and stuff. And he's and he also he, he helps the veterans and he's he's into alternative medicine like I am. So he said, John, I got this chiropractor. I said, wait a while. Chi I like chiropractors. Some of them are good. Some of them. He said, no, 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 no. This guy don't even touch you with his hands. I said, what is he? Uh, is he a hypnotist? I mean, what does he do? You know. So he said, no, no, John, wait to see what happens. I want you to go to him. Because I have stenosis in my back from doing karate and judo, and I have neck pain. And so does my wife has back pain. So I said, okay. So we go to this place in Clearwater, Florida. Guy's a real nice guy. He does some, uh, 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 what do you call it? Uh, he puts us through some things. And then he says, all right, I want you to go get an x-ray of your neck. So we go get an x-ray of our neck. We come back, we show him the x-ray, it's on a CD the next morning, okay, he does his calculations, he lays me on the table, and he shows my wife I'm one foot shorter than the other, okay, the reason that happens a lot of times is that when you're in pain, your muscles contract, and it knocks your body out of, out of balance, okay? So he has this machine, he lays me down with my head on the side, and he aims this bar 
right to my neck, doesn't even touch my neck. I hear a click. He sends a frequency to my neck. And I want to explain to you about this. And he says to my wife, come to the end of the table. So my wife comes and says, look at his feet. They were even. I get off the table and I don't have any pain anymore. I said, what is this? So he explained to me what it was. Now I know a lot of, I do a lot of science and research. There's a thing called, do you know what the atlas is? You know what that is? What is it? The an atlas, the for the with the world map on it? No, 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 no. not that. Okay. <laughs> then okay. no, I don't. I didn't know either, so it's okay. okay. Don't worry. Okay. You're a good company because I didn't know. <laughs> okay. All right. The atlas is the bone on top of your below your neck that holds up your head. That's well, that why makes they call sense. It the atlas. Okay? That makes sense. Now, the atlas, you see, can you see my hands? Okay. See my finger that's below my hand? Okay. Mm -hmm. When the atlas is out of alignment, look what happens to my vertebrae. Yeah. It compensates. This could be a bulging disc. This can also cause you pain, but it does something else. Inside the atlas is where your nerves go through. They go down your spinal column that goes into your major organs. On the other side of your atlas is your inner carotid artery, okay? That blood flow goes by your optic nerve and also goes into your brain where your blood flows into your brain and then flows out of your brain to get rid of the toxins. When you align that to its genetic predisposition, the way it's supposed mm. to be, you correct all of that. Wow. When he sends a frequency to that um, atlas, he straightens it out because of the angle that it hits. You ever see some people say, what do you mean a frequency? You ever see sound hit water and you see how the water ripples? Well, that sound has power. So it hits the atlas and straightens it out the way he does his calculations. Wow. I sent about, I don't know, about eight of my friends and they all call me up and they go, what the hell is this? I say, why? I don't have any pain. I've had it for years. They wanted to operate on my back. They wanted to operate on my neck. What the heck is this stuff? I said, I told you what it was. I had to convince friends to go. They wouldn't believe me. They go, John, you tell me you to lay on the table. The guy don't touch you. He, he has this little machine. He presses a button and you walk off and you fight. I said, yeah. I'm taking my husband there. <laughs> oh, I'm that serious. I'm this telling you, we, we've got family in Clearwater, so hey, we know where that's at. Okay, so it's called epicclinics.com. I don't own anything of it. I'm not financially involved with it yet because I'm going to, okay? Because this is going to change a lot about what goes on with addiction because remember... I said about the people that go to treatment and get rid of the drugs, but they're on pay, with pain mm -hmm, meds. Mm -hmm. Well, if I get rid of their pain, the relapse rate absolutely goes down. So look, guys, I, I don't expect you to believe me. I'm a daredevil. I go try things anyway. You know? So what can I tell you? Like I worked with Dr. Blum, I told you he's the geneticist of the addiction gene. We had an amino acid formula. Now amino acids are the precursors for neurotransmission. That means your neurons in your brain, it's how it works, okay? We did 15 research papers on it. With fMRIs, double blind studies, we showed how amino acids in the proper formulation, a proper compound can upregulate Dopamine, which hmm. is unheard of. Dopamine is what addicts chase when they want to do drugs. Okay, and serotonin. Mm -hmm. So you got a lot of information. And if you yes. want to know about the addiction book, How to Beat Your Addiction and Live a Quality Life. The way I wrote that book was, look, I don't know everything. I don't even know what I know sometimes. Okay? But what I did learn was, I learned from other people. So I 
interviewed about almost about well, around a couple of hundred addicts and alcoholics and people that had other behaviors. There's food addiction, sex addiction, gambling addiction. There's a whole bunch of other addictions out there, porn addiction, internet addiction. And people go, well, what do you mean? How do I know I'm an addict? I said, like, I'm making it real simple for you, okay? When you continue to do a behavior or a substance in spite of adverse consequences, maybe you have a problem. I mean, if you keep doing something, you keep getting punched in the face, okay, maybe you got to take a duck or get out of the way at least, you know? So that's a simple way of seeing if you're an addict or not, okay? Um, the bottom line is, is that I learned that there are things out there, okay, that most people don't know about. And my job is to investigate that. Spirituality is the foundation for me of any recovery. Okay? Not religion. I'm not touting religion. Come on. I'm touting spirituality. Learn to be kind instead of right. Do your best not to lie, cheat, or steal. Do your best not to hurt yourself or other people. Reach out and help people less fortunate than you. Simple stuff. Okay? Real simple stuff. We're all God's kids. I don't care what color you are, what denomination you want to be. You know, come on, man. It's that simple. You know, that's just the way it is. You know, I, I, I look, I listen to the news and what this kid did in the black community over there. It's so sad. There's so much evil and sickness in the world. Mm -hmm. But, you know, it's the way the world is. It's been that way for many, many years. All we can do is the best we can. And don't blame this one or blame that one. This be the best person you can be. Absolutely. That's all we can be, man. Oh, John, you know, this interview is epic because of the information. And, and I told you before we got started, the reason why I started this platform is for this reason right here. Because you have information that some people have never heard of. They've been dealing with things their whole life and they've been told that they just have a problem or they're stupid or they're lazy or they're whatever it is that they are. But there's something internal going on. It, it's a root cause that we are missing and then we are feeding it because we're not trying to weed it out. You know, we're, we, we, well, feed we don't even it. know what to weed out. That's the problem. Like but, I was telling you about the book, Okay, so I interviewed 200 people that had good recovery, not just quitting drugs and alcohol as behaviors, but actually had a life of recovery, okay? What that means is, you know, having integrity, have values, and, you know, and have a quality life. Then I interviewed about 150 people that chronically relapsed. I want to know what they did and what they didn't do, and I put that into the book. Then I put my own stuff into the book. The book is really simple. Addicts do not like to read. So... I made it where you can just look short little paragraphs. You can pick whatever you want out in the book that you're having a problem with and go to that part. Yeah. And the print is big, so you don't get intimidated by small print. Yeah. See? I mean, what more can you do when someone gives you the information? You have to want the information. You got to be willing to try to understand something different because we get so used to doing the same thing. We get so used to the routines and this is the way that it is. Like you said, growing up, what you grew up in, what you saw, you wanted something different, but you had to find a way to do something different. You know, you know, it, it, you know, people go, well, I don't know if I can do this and I don't know if I can do that. You're right. You don't know. So that means you got to give it a shot. Absolutely. Okay. And remember, no decision is a decision. I keep telling people that. And, you know, most people think, well, that's not going to happen to me. Or this is not going to happen to me. And no, no. You don't know anything. I don't know anything. You know what I know? I don't know. That's what I really know. So and, let me know. ask you this question. What was, your, what was your favorite drug? What was your best drug? Okay. The, the question is usually asked this way. Let me just flip it a little bit. What's the worst drug that you did? All right? 
Well, the what? reason why I'm asking this question, I'm gonna follow it up with something. So that's why I wanted right. to ask you, what right. was right. your best? What What was your best drug that you was your go to that just really gave that what you were looking for? What was it? Well, all of them. I did every drug known to man. All right, the one that I settled in with was cocaine, but I did every drug known to man. And, but today, I don't even know how people are doing drugs. First of all, they're putting fentanyl in everything. <clears throat> so coke is no longer cocaine. Now it's fentanyl on it. People are dying. Over 100,000 yes. people died. Wow. Now, I ask you that because I want to know, that was something that you lived for at that time. What's your best high now? My best high now? Your best high. What is your best high now? Real simple. Helping God's kids, talking to you. Amen. What's better high than that? Hey, and you know what? You put it together. It's so simple. It's so simple, but we'd rather make it hard. We think that it's so difficult to make a change. You are, what did you say, 70 what? Tell us again. I'm going to be 76th in August. Come on now. 76 in August, and we've got 20-year-olds that don't know their head from a hole in the ground. But you can turn it around, and you are living proof that that is possible. No matter where you come from, no matter what you've gone through, you can always be who you choose to be. And the thing is, I believe that everything that you endured and encountered in your life is for the results that we have now. Everybody can't go through what you've been through and be able to live to talk about it and be able to help others. But you were purposed with this task to be able to be here today and tell people, hey, yes, you can. Well, you know, one of, one of the interviewers once asked me, he says, what would you change in your life? Simple answer. Nothing. Yeah. It's everything that happened in my life got me where I am today. Absolutely. Well, I think you got enough information. Man. I mean... This is this is good stuff, and and this is live, but we are gonna air this on the podcast later. So on the podcast, it'll just be total interview. And now Spotify actually does the videos of the podcast, um, so we can put the podcast on the as a video because I think this is so genuine and authentic. And I think that there's someone out there today that needed to hear this, and if they are not able to hear it today, they're going to be able to hear it in the future because it's going to be out there. I thank you so much for taking the time to sharing your story, to sharing your resources, to sharing your joy, and to just let us know that we should never do what? Never give up, baby. Hey, that's it. <laughs> it's, hey, it's that simple. Never so, give up, man. So I just, I want to just say this. In life, people, what is your mission? Maybe we don't know, but when we get on a path, we'll end up figuring out what our mission is. We often associate ourselves with trauma. But we don't understand that we don't have to be that. We can come out of it when we have a spiritual awakening. Because this life is all about a spiritual awakening. Every encounter, every breath we take is a renewal of life for us to be able to be a better version of who well, we are. I, I tell people, don't sit in your stuff. I tell them, keep moving because it's hard to hit a moving target. Yes, yes, <laughs> yes. So don't be lazy and don't be too busy for yourself and your health that you can't take the time out to live a quality life because that's what it's all about. There's time and there's hope. So wherever you are in life, wherever you are in this moment, if you are on the verge of feeling like you are about to go over the edge, take a step back, reevaluate the situation. Look at John's story and know that there is hope in this life. John, thank you so much. What is it? If there's anything else, because I think you've said more than enough. Is there anything that you would like to just leave us with before we jump off of here. Real simple. Don't believe anything I told you. Go look, <laughs> it, up. Go look it up, people. Go look it up, man. Go I look don't, it I up. Don't, I don't, you know, listen, I ain't preaching to you. You know, you're going to preach to yourself. Amen. Amen. Well, thank you so much. Thank, thank you, you for everyone that tuned in today. And if you're not able to catch the live, please look it up on the um, replay. And it's also streaming on YouTube. You know what? The best you you can be is you. So continue to work on yourself. Seek help early and often and go get the book. Tell them where to get the book again. Amazon. Go to Amazon. Everybody, Amazon is doing big things. Everybody knows Amazon. It's a click of a button on your phone. Go out there, check it out. We've got the um, website streaming at the bottom of the screen, johngiardono.com. 
Go out there and learn something for yourself. Don't listen to me either. Don't take my advice on anything. I bring this information to you so you can take it and find out for yourself what you can use to help you. So with that, all I can tell you now is you were created with a purpose. So go be great. This is your life. Remember, mindful intentions nurture and drive your business. God bless you. Have a good day. And go and like and share these videos because I'm just trying to help somebody to help somebody. God bless you. <laughs> okay. All righty. So we are getting ready to get out of here. Have a good day. You too. All right. John, hang out with me.